Hello there. Welcome to Just the Discs. My name is Brian, and we talk about Blu-rays here. I am joined by my friend, Mr. Jonathan Hertzberg from Fun City Editions once more. Hello, sir. Hey, Brian. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. This is a special place because I think I think you were the first show or podcast to to, to host me. So oh, I love that. I love being a part of it. And uh, we're talking, of course, about Fun City again. We're talking about um, we're going to get right into it, folks. We are talking about Primetime Panic 2, the second set of television movies from Fun City uh, following the wonderful Primetime Panic one set um so sir can you tell me just a little bit about the overriding thematics between we have three films here we have if you want to go through the films and then talk about any overriding stuff and we can kind of go one by one whatever however you'd like to do it sure so the three films are the death of richie from 1977 incident at crestridge from 1981 and the seduction of gina from 1984 and these titles, the thing that links, or one of the things that links all of these titles is they were all produced in some way by a man named Michael Jaffe. And some of those films were co-produced with other people, like Seduction of Gina is actually produced by Michael Jaffe and Valerie Bertinelli, the star of the film. And of course, these are issue movies similar to how primetime panic one was they were there so that so that that moniker still fits and you know in a in a very general way they're ripped from the headlines movies and also um and primetime panic one were those three movies were also similarly linked by their producers so very cool yeah Two two films about addiction, different kinds of addiction, and and another that's a whole other animal that we'll get into. But um, yeah, but, so you but cor- corruption, you know, political corruption. Political, yes, yes, political corruption. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But but death of Richie, I got to say, I'm really really excited about that. Was the one I was familiar with when you announced this set, and you and I have I think talked about this movie. Uh, I I, I, I kind of have a memory of you talking about it, like back in Madison, like. I remember like in the 90s some at some point. I don't I, I'm trying to remember when I saw this list, but it could have been in the 90s. It was a list of films that um, Vincent Gallo was a fan of. And okay. he he had called out a few of the, uh, Ben Gazzara movies. And I can't remember what the other one was. But Death of Richie was definitely one of the movies that Vincent Gallo cited as a big favorite. And I would dare say part of his i mean i'm sure you know the cassavetti stuff certainly as well but part of his inclination to cast uh mr gazara in buffalo 66 as an interestingly i don't want to say he's quite a similar dad because I, I find the dad and that he plays in death richie more sympathetic than the character in buffalo 66 but i do think it's interesting that he cast him as his dad uh yeah. in that movie well he, yeah there's a few, I've, I've found a number of quotes from Gallo, where he cites Death of Richie as a big influence on him. He was a big fan of Robbie Benson. And then, yeah, when he was casting Buffalo 66, apparently, yeah, he was he was inspired to to cast Ben in the in the father role. And somebody said somebody posted online somewhere in response to one of our posts um, that Apparently, Gazzara was was pissed uh, at Gallo, whether it was like really or just kind of jokingly pissed off that that he said that he cast him because of Death of Richie and not because of, you know, his Cassavetes association. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, I, you know, pretty funny. I mean, I, I could see it going either way with him, you know, joking or not. It's I I would be inclined to think he was joking, but who knows? But he's really good. And I was going to say between. And I don't know how you feel about um, Sarah T. Portrait of a Teenage Alcoholic, but that happens to be one of my favorite television movies, especially issue movies. And mm-hmm. I put Death of Richie like right in the same spectrum as that because I feel like they're two really heartfelt, affecting um, issue movies where the performances carry the message. I mean, you can you can see people maybe getting into a, a place of camp and wanting to laugh at either one. 
but mm-hmm. I don't find them that way. I actually find them incredibly moving and affecting in both the lead performances between Linda Blair and Robbie Benson. Um, and actually all the performances in um, Death of Richie, I find really compelling. But but sorry, we're getting ahead of ourselves. What is Death of Richie about? Sure. So Death of Richie is a suburban set family melodrama about the difficult relationship between a father and son, in particular uh, played by Ben Gazzara and Robbie Benson, and the sons um, spiraling into not only drug addiction, but um, but also untreated mental illness. And, and the, you know, the movie goes into goes into that as as well so that's another issue it's not just drugs it's also untreated mental issues and then the you know obviously the connections between those two things and it's based on a true story as i understand based on a real incident right so it is based on a true story i've not read the book that it's based on but yes it's a it's about a a a true story about a, a father and a son and all the tragic tragic things that happen uh you know between yeah. them um, yeah and it opens with a funeral where which is not too hard to infer based on the title that you know richie's dead you know like yes. that's that's pretty yeah, easy to no, see there's no getting around it so yeah yeah and I and this is so. sorry yeah. i was gonna say this is the second robbie benson movie in the uh fun city collection which is great and he's really good after jeremy yes, yes we had robbie and jeremy which was fun city editions number three and now we have him in the death of Richie. And this was made a uh, few, five, maybe four or five years after uh, after Jeremy was made. Yeah, he is he's really such a neat performer because I find him, especially in this movie, but where the character is, you know, struggling with the addiction. He's got a group of friends which are fascinating because it's uh <laughs> Chuck Fleischer, Clint Howard, and you probably know the third guy. I don't recognize the third guy. I don't remember the other guys. Yeah, the, I don't remember the other guy's name. I think if you look him up on IMDb, he had other credits. But yeah, the the two the the two other guys you mentioned are obviously recognizably recognizable faces to cult movie audiences for sure. I made sure to have Clint illustrated on the on the back of the slipcover, <laughs> which I, I love told, that you did that. Yeah, I told because I think I think he had somebody else somebody else's face. He might have had Fleischer, and I just felt like, hey, you kind of gotta have. Because there's limited, there's limited space. And yeah. I, say, I kind of feel like Clint Howard should be on there. Well, and I also love just talking about the artwork for a second, how you very much, you know, echoed the design of Primetime One, which has the same vertical strips. Of yes, well, yeah, it's the same artist. It's Jacob Phillips. Very he nice artwork. the one who actually came up with that concept for the first one, you know, in terms of how to, like, fit art for each movie on, on the front. So That's really sharp. It works. Credit to Jacob. I love it. Yeah. My, my my contribution on the last one and on this one was the color scheme. Like the last one, the first one was Primetime Panic 1 was, you know, more like newspaper print. And I kind of wanted it to look a little different. The second one to stand out, but also look the same. Yeah. So hence red. Yeah, it's great. I love it. And, I, and it, I, unintentional or not, it ties into Death of Richie uh, with the reds. Um, I know that's probably unintentional, but um, not intentional. Like... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so like it's a really neat cast. I think that's one of the things I love about it. You know, the Gazara yeah. and Robbie Benson relationship is great. Of course, the mother is played by Eileen Brennan, who will come yes. up again in the next movie. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. young Lance Kerwin plays James at 15's Lance Kerwin plays his younger brother. Yeah, um, yeah, not a lot for him to do, but he's still very good. Uh, and then yeah. you and I are big fans of John Friedrich, and he shows up as another friend in the film. And that's yeah, John Friedrich from The Wanderers, and and um, isn't uh, one of the sister, one of the Eilbacker's sisters? Playing, yes, uh, Cindy, playing... I think. Yeah, yeah not Lisa, but Cindy. I, Cindy. I know her less. I know Lisa a little bit yeah. more, but but and yeah, of course they were in Bad Ronald. Yes. And there's a l- weird sl- slight, ever so slight bad Ronald connection in that he has yeah. Robbie Benson's character has a, a p- panel he can pull out in his wall yes, and it's yes. a little room behind his closet that's filled right. with black light posters. It's his drug room, basically. Yeah, where yeah, he he's goes, got his drug room. <laughs> you know, and hides himself. So yeah, yeah, it's it's a really, like I said, it's a really compelling performance from him because he, you can see he's struggling with depression or whatever mental illness and yeah. his dad is trying to motivate him 
And there are times when he does get through to him and, and he gets him to get a job and he gets him yeah. to sell some tickets for a raffle. And both times you see this incredible, um, not quite euphoria, but like a really up spirited Robbie Benson, which I, again, I think to some might maybe play a little cheesy, but I find him so affecting when he's in that mode. Yeah. He's, he becomes almost even more childlike, despite having been older than he is in Jeremy. And yeah. it's just yeah. that much more moving when he starts to spiral backwards. Right. Yeah. When he gets violent, it, it, it it's more meaningful because Robbie Benson is so inherently nice and innocent and good. And um, so it is, I think, and I'm sure at the time, you know, when audiences saw this, it probably was the first time where they saw that uh, switch flipped and saw him playing this violent, you know, out of control uh, character. Cause I don't think he, I don't think he had done that before. So, yeah. And as far as like the, like you say, the stuff that could play cheesy or whatever. I mean, I think that's all just, I felt like, I feel like a lot of that just kind of uh, goes back to what's your attitude going into the movie. If you're looking to go into it as like, Oh, for all these movies, if you're looking to go in with more of an MST three K kind of, angle then yeah it's gonna be chock full of uh stuff to you know snicker at i guess i don't know yeah i find it like the way it starts kind of heartbreak just heartbreaking just yeah the, i just agree the initials opening with the funeral i just think it's really it's all right there there's no sugarcoating anything i mean the emotion i think is all it's all pretty sincere that's what it is it's sincere so and i think robbie is being totally sincere throughout the whole movie so i just think a lot of times people's sometimes the modern audience's reaction sometimes to that is to laugh at it because i don't know why <laughs> no I, <laughs> that's a I'm another conversation yeah i shouldn't even bring it up but it's just one of those things where it, it doesn't affect me that way and and right. like you say that funeral opening and then i would go so far as to say even the second scene is a flashback to obviously you know before and we see ben gazzara after Robbie's character has snuck into the house, goes into his room to talk to him mm -hmm. and you expect the conversation. And this is touched on in Sam Deegan's commentary, which is a great, I got to sample that a great choice to have her do this movie. Um, she touches on this conversation. Think you think it's going to go one way and it's really him reaching out to his son and trying to explain how, why things are the way they are in a way. And it's I, I, between that funeral opening and that scene, I find myself fully locked in to a serious movie. And ready to sympathize with all the characters involved, including Eileen Brennan, who is equally great as the you know suffering mother uh, in this. It's really yeah, yeah. She's, a easy to, she's easy to over get overshadowed because yeah, yeah, because it's definitely marketed more as like you know clash between father and son. So yeah, yeah, but it but it's fascinating because it touches on like you know court procedures you can take with your child uh, if you're is so inclined to be concerned that they're a problem. I forget what the waiver is that he goes after initially, but it's, it's basically telling the cops, one of his buddies explains to him, it's like telling the cops, this is a bad kid. Keep an eye on him, which is kind of what it is. And so like, it's, a, it's a real struggle, like I said, and, and it's neat to see, I don't think, I don't know how many television movies Gazzara did, but um, I would think it was a ton. I know he did some t TV appearances certainly, but yeah, I'm um, not sure. I don't have I don't have his IMDb in front of me, but I mean, you know, obviously at that time we just can't wait. We just went through not even the whole cast on this movie, and there's so many people that are that you've seen in feature films and also doing these TV movies. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's actually a number of TV movie TV credits on Ben's resume. I mean, he's a working actor, you know. True, and that and that was a big source of income for. Uh, working actors in the 1970s tv yeah, appearances, I mean, I tv movies I, yeah because i don't think you know the the the, the cassavetes movies those were <laughs> those were art movies yeah you know? he wasn't Just, he wasn't keeping his mortgage going with those necessarily probably 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 not there are those yeah. those movies i mean he, you know we romanticize the that that era but i mean those those movies were hard, wouldn't wouldn't be mainstream movies back then either or easy sells either yeah. so I, I what I guess I was getting at is I just think it's a really great performance in any TV movie. And certainly among for me, I, I mean, 
I think it's one of his good, great performances. Like, I really do think he brings so much to it. Like, you can really feel him and his heartache uh, going through this whole situation. It's it's powerful stuff. Yeah, it's really, it really is the, the stuff that really kind of, that I think is the most heartbreaking is that he's just not open to or can't bring himself to go, you know, the route that his wife is suggesting, which is to to take seriously the, take take the mental health route, you know, that, you know, to, to go, to go the route of mental health specialists and try to figure out the problem that way. Yeah. I mean, he's more of the, I guess you might say old fashioned, like he's from an older generation and he can't bring himself to be open to that. You know, to that, that's the part that's really sad to me is that, that, that acknowledging that your son has got, some kind of mental illness is is such a taboo or more that that's more of a roadblock to him than getting the police involved you know yeah and, yeah absolutely uh i was just looking him up and there's at least a good five six seven tv movies here i'm not surprised you're right um yeah. but this has got to be in the top uh echelon of of his work for me of, of this period well anyway i think it's a i think it's a great movie and i love that it's included in this set i think it's a really big deal that this is getting a, a blu-ray release as part of this set because i just think it's a special film but the other two films i'll be honest i was not familiar with at all well it's, i just I, wanted to say about richie oh uh, yeah one thing is yes it is like probably it is one of those movies that of tv movies that's right re- I think probably the most recognizable by name and maybe part of that's because of the Vincent Gallo connection and he, and it's been name dropped over the years. Uh, maybe it was also rerun a lot more than other TV movies. I'm, I'm not really sure, but mm-hmm. one thing I can say, and we have a note on the Blu-ray is that the best available element, complete element for Richie uh, that we had access to is a six is it was a 16 millimeter print so we did color correction on the 16 millimeter print because it was really faded really beat up there's lots of emulsion scratches and things on it and i just thought i i felt that to go further and try to clean it up further would just introduce other other artifacts like digital artifacts and things that people wouldn't be happy with so it's really got the look of a print the one thing we did do is bring color back you know bring some color back to it but it was so that's just even though we have a note at the start i just wanted to make that point that there just isn't a better element so this is kind of like what is what it is but we just felt that it was best to kind of maintain that integrity i guess so you have to look at it as a as if you're watching a 16 millimeter print of yeah the film yeah no that's fair that's without without much you know no real, you know, denoising or degraining or any, you know, anything like that. So. I, 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 t- I totally understand. It. And I'm, you know, it's nice that you guys have the warning at the front and that you mention it here. I think you did a nice job with the color because I feel like the color, it doesn't look as faded as I would have thought it might look. So I'm, I'm, I think I it can looks- tell you, yeah, I can tell you from seeing the original element that it was really faded and this looks, there's definitely, Obviously, it's not great, but it's. I think it's a pretty mark, you know, uh, a pretty significant improvement. And there's a different color grade that's in the streaming versions. So if you see it, it I think ours is a is a new pass at it. I think the colors may be a little more, a little more vibrant on ours. Yeah, I think it looks good, you know. And and again, you've mentioned the scratches on the, and I don't mind that kind of stuff. And uh, there's a certain charm to that, I think. Uh, regardless, it's it's so neat to have it here. I just I think yeah. it'd be a loss to throw it out because of the elements. To lose the movie would be a big big loss in my mind. Yeah. So so that's cool. very cool. Uh, um, yeah, happy to happy to ha- be able to bring it back in some you know in some fashion. Yeah, it's really a special one, and I I am excited for more people to get to check it out and listen to that Sam Deegan commentary, which is great. Um, moving on, there's the rest of these I haven't heard of, as I mentioned. So incident in Crestridge, uh, 81, what, what can you yeah. tell me about this one? So this one is kind of like, um, uh, a modern, you know, contemporary Western it's set in Wyoming and it's about a fam, a couple that moves from East somewhere to Wyoming where they think they're going to have 
I guess maybe some kind of semi-retirement and, you know, more, more land and peace from wherever they moved from, which the story implies is like some Eastern city, you know, I think I saw an Ohio is, plate on their car. I don't know if that's, yeah. So, which is code for crowded, dirty city somewhere <laughs> They're you know, they're moving to the country where they think things are going to be cleaner and more peaceful and friendlier and et cetera. And then they find that they're moving to this town, which is rife with corruption. And there's a corrupt sheriff and there's a corrupt mayor who's played by Pernell Roberts, who was on Bonanza, one of the most popular Western TV series of all time. So it's kind of fitting that here in night when this movie was aired in 1981, that you'd have, you'd have somebody like him who would have been recognizable at that time for that role playing in sort of a modern updated Western. So it's kind of like a little bit of, and it's got a little bit of a high noon kind of quality where it ends up that the couple played by Eileen Brennan and um, Sandy McPeak. Uh, Eileen Brennan is the one who becomes the law, the, the, the person of the law. She's the one, she's the lady with the badge, which was one of the original titles for the movie. So instead of it being the guy, coming into a town and cleaning things up it's a woman so that was very much like of that of this time early 80s and second wave feminism and everything so what you have is eileen brennan is the one who's taking on these forces of corruption in crestridge and her husband played by sandy mcpeak is uh is is supportive but he's on the sidelines so that's like the big that's the that's the flip or what this movie was doing that was different from the old school Westerns. Yeah, no, that's, I hadn't thought about the modern Western angle of it. That's a perfect description. Um, It's very much so. It's also based on true, true events. There really was a lady with a badge who, who took on a corrupt mayor in a town in Wyoming where a massage parlor was burnt down. And this all is all, and this is all what happens in this, in this movie. It was all based on real, real events. Yeah. Not surprisingly, even though it's not acknowledged. A lot of times these movies wouldn't necessarily say based on a true story because of for legal reasons, but didn't didn't take too much digging to see that it was based on real story. And the guy who wrote it, Jim Burns is his name. I think if you look up his IMDb, he wrote a lot of Westerns, a lot of TV Westerns before. So it definitely has that in its blood. You know, it has that that tradition in its blood and also in the in the story the idea that this is sort of like an old western movie come to life is something that one of the characters says sandy mcpeak says that to to um eileen brennan nice yeah she's very good in the movie i just seen pernell roberts in um bud bedeker's ride lonesome Yes, uh, just rewatching is, that, and I was like, he's a great, you know, subtle yeah, villain in that. That's his best. That's I think his best, like feature, probably his best feature film role because he primarily did a lot of TV. You know, like once he became Trapper you know, John Amanda, and stuff. Was he Trapper John or was he in he Trapper, was Trapper John? John? Yeah. So the yeah. interesting thing is that when Incident at Crestridge was on CBS in 1981. Also on CBS at that time, Eileen Brennan was starring in the TV version of Private Benjamin. Oh, wow. And Pernell Roberts was starring as Trapper John MD. They were both (laughs) on the same network. So they were like network stars and then doing a TV movie for the same network. That's interesting, especially to see how they play off each other, which is quite adversarial. Like she's a really strong female character, like really not taking any guff from the, the present sheriff and then you know, is able to get herself elected the new sheriff. And mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a neat performance from her. It's, it's really helped. I think not really, but definitely helped by the fact that one of the deputies is played by um, Bruce Davison, Bruce Davison, who's really, yeah, yeah. really good. In it, and good. I, I, I like He's him really as a good. backup. He's really good. He doesn't show up until like 40 minutes into the movie, but you know, it's yeah. nice, nice to see him. A lot of yeah. the other actors were local. They were like, uh, Utah. Ah. It was actually filmed in Utah. This oh. movie, interestingly enough, was filmed in Park City, Utah. And so it actually was filmed when Sundance Film Festival was still very new and young and well before Sundance became what Sundance is now. So it's very interesting because you get to see this town was still kind of like a small Western town at the time. And little did they know that because they make a whole big thing. I, I did a lot of research 
in the you know newspapers at the time this movie was a whole big deal at the time in park city because of the fact that it was like hollywood's come to park city you know they're making <laughs> a movie here and so it's really funny that not too long after that park city would become like the indie movie hub of this country you know and, yeah. and obviously it's changed a ton but back then it was still kind of on you know hadn't really been touched by the industry which is kind of cool to see yeah, so a lot of the actors same. are from there and then if you look them up they also they most of their credits are on other movies that were shot in utah so for instance there's people that were in footloose a couple of years after this movie because <laughs> that was a cool. utah, that was a utah production nice uh, yeah yeah, it's a, whatever the, the local acting seems to be pretty pool seems to be pretty strong. There's some good supporting people The the actual sheriff. Uh, I swear I recognize him, but he doesn't show up in almost any other movie. Yeah, but he no, looks familiar. Yeah, yeah and totally. He does. He does. The only people that really have uh, that are from outside are Eileen Brennan and Pernell Roberts and Sandy McPeak and Bruce huh. Davison. And I want to say Cliff Osmond. Yeah. Uh, who Dino loves and he talks a lot about it on the commentary. Yeah. I was going to say you and uh, Dino Proserpio do commentary on this one. Uh, you guys yes, did commentary. We, we, yeah. Yeah. We on, earlier, uh, did, we, we did dreams don't die on, on, on the first set. I love that track and I love hearing you guys together. And Dino does the, I eat movies podcast, which I'm a big fan of you. And I've both been on that podcast. Very enjoyable yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. We have a good rapport. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think this movie actually now I've, I've seen this one the most of the three. And I think it plays pretty, actually plays fairly modern because Eileen Brennan's character really is, it's a very positive portrayal, very no-nonsense portrayal of a woman coming in and basically, you know, and cleaning, cleaning a frankly very messy shop up. And, and it does look, I think, when you look at it through 2023 20, eyes, and like post me too eyes, I think it looks pretty, it looks pretty good because, you know, just a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of movies from this time can be dated when they're portraying sexual politics and, and, and what have you. And I think this movie actually looks still looks pretty good in, 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 you know, when you, when you hold it up to a modern, you know, what our sensibilities are now, you know, she's just a, she's an unwavering, really strong, very, you know, very, very fair and very, uh, you know, very honest and tough, like you said, character. You know, she doesn't take any guff and all, you know, and 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 she proves to be just a much more efficient, efficient leader than the people that were in charge before her. Yeah, no, she's really great in this. And it's great to see her in two movies in a row like this. Um, yeah. and, and certainly the issues of police and police corruption and, you know, general mishandling of uh you know, police work uh, is not an issue that's, you know, in any way gone away. It's definitely something that people right. still have, pay a lot of attention to. You're right. It does play of the three very, very modern in that sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, surprise, surprisingly so. I mean, a lot of it does also feel like a, it feels in a lot of ways like the hour long dramas of the day that, you know, there were so many police, you know, crime centered, you know, episodic, tv dramas in that day and age and and it does have a lot of feeling at times of that in terms of like the use of music and some of the some of the uh the you know the action sequences and stuff like that the suspense parts does 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 sort of feel like of its of its time and in fact a lot of people thought that it was going to be a there was a pilot for a series but Eileen Brennan said, Either, I, I'm doing another series. So this <laughs> is not a pilot for another series, but it has that feeling like it could have been. Like yeah. She could have been a character that they could have made into a weekly series character. And I think, and Dino and I talked about that. She had, she and Sandy McPeak have such great chemistry that they really, they do feel like they could have been like a husband and wife, like a weekly, you know, you could have gone back to them. They could have been a weekly series, of, you know, a couple of characters. And there obviously were so many series in that time period that did center on a couple, you know? Um, so, yeah, no, that's a good call. They would have been great together. They are very good in the film. It's, and it's a neat one. It's under very underseen of the three, I think. Um, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it's definitely not the, the other two go, you know, I was really hoping people will notice probably that we have the death of Richie. We have the seduction of Gina. I really wanted to find another movie that was the, the something of, of something, someone, <laughs> of someone. No, I like 
like you know the you know the defeat of uh bobby i don't know you know like <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted something yeah you know something like that but we got an incident instead uh, it works i, I actually kind of like the variation on it like you know then we can come back to let's we can move on to seduction gene actually which another one i hadn't seen uh and i i definitely enjoyed um valerie bertinelli stars produces um and this is like i think amanda reyes does the commentary which is great she's an excellent mm-hmm. choice of course for any television movie um but she mentioned this was like her fifth tv movie or something like that and i don't know how many as producer but she had done a bunch she was spinning off of um one day at a time right i guess yeah 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 she was um she was at this point quite a quite enterprising like she was really young but she was pretty she had her own production company so yeah this was um one of a number of yeah tv films that that she stars in and and produces and this one i have to say as soon as i turned it on and it had the mont this great montage sequence of valerie bertinelli walking through these like seedy red light districts in broad daylight in san francisco in 1983 when they filmed it she's passing through these like um all these strip clubs and it's broad daylight and there's guys all these barkers outside that are like trying to get customers and trying to get her to you know <laughs> maybe come in and maybe you know may, may, maybe uh, consider working there and then it's got this great synth driven eddie van halen track and eddie yeah. eddie and valerie of course were were married at the time or if they weren't married yet they were a couple and um so i just like as soon as i saw that i was like oh this is this is like this is catnip because it's early 80s it's urban so it's like a fun city but it's like a fun city san francisco in the same way that we've had some fun city new york movies we've also had some fun city la movies we have some fun city paris movies coming up so meaning movies that are set in in uh in and even uh fun city uh london with uh radio on um yeah. I'm probably forgetting some uh but these were you know these are movies that were made because all these cities it's not just new york were um at that time in the 70s and 80s where i you know experience had experienced you know white flight and rise in crime and and you know resource loss of resources and stuff like that so you know in san francisco you don't see it as much so i just thought once i saw that opening sequence i was like oh i i think i'm gonna like this one uh i think this one is a winner because i had not seen it before um yeah and and, it's a uh, it's a gambling movie and i i'm a big gambling movie fan i mean they're pretty straightforward gambling addiction movies and and they tee up certain things in the beginning of the movie like she's got a $30,000 Thirty thousand dollar trust fund, and you're like, oh dear, yeah. this is this is going to be tricky, right? Um, right. But and it's but also I, a very strong. It's also a very strong uh, female, female lead, female. This both of these these last two movies are 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 definitely very female driven, and you know, and this has been alluded to on on the audio commentary tracks by our experts um, from the first set and on this one that a lot of these movies were, a lot of these TV movies were made for women about women because they were counter programming to a lot of other popular programming for instance football and other sports and things like that the, these movies were going against things like that that were largely drawing a, a man a, you know a, a male audience so that's another that's another thing i think this is a real in the same way that eileen brennan is so well showcased in the in 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 Crestridge, I think this is such a good showcase for for Valerie Bertinelli and Seduction of Gina. I mean, she just goes through every emotion in this movie. Like she just really she really goes through the ringer. She really yes. does. She, yeah, no, she's. I mean, the the short setup is that she lives with her husband. She's married him. He's an, a medical intern on his way to being a doctor, but he's very busy. He's not home very much. Yeah, and she sort of gets hooked into some gambling through some happenstance basically and ends up um going to tahoe and meeting a guy there and it's 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 a really neat movie in that sense and i love uh the supporting cl- cast includes dinah manhoff or manhoff um from greece and a bunch of other stuff she's great and then of course ed louder as her dad is a hundred percent i know you love touchdown. Ed Louder. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, and again, he, I made sure he's on the back of the slipcover art too. That's great. And and it's yeah. he, he well, he, I got to know him as a dad. I think I maybe I've told you the story, maybe I haven't, but I saw him first and girls just want to have fun. So he's been a, a hard nosed dad before, but this is a really interesting, you know, that dad character you can you could see is a little bit comedic. This guy is like serious and he's and he's there's a there's one really great moment that I won't go too far into where the husband and the dad have a moment where they they both take stock of maybe their own role in her addiction. And yeah. it's a really great scene. And and Louder has to kind of take a step back and go, geez, I don't know, I guess. Yeah, maybe, you know, but he's yeah. really strong in it. And I like him a lot, but but he's a very authoritarian kind of dad. So that's right. an extra added tension that I, I really enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. Um, and then also Frederick Len. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but he's the he plays the the husband, the young doctor. Mm. He was uh, in Ordinary People. He's been in a ton of stuff. That's he right. Like he still acts now. He's he's got a huge resume. But I remember him from before this playing one of uh, Tim Hutton's uh, friends in Ordinary People. And, in and fact, isn't Dinah Manoff is in? I was going to say well. yes. They're yeah. both in that. That's great. Yes. I wondered. Yeah, those two looked really familiar to me. Yeah. In a way and that I was look, like, if you look him, him up, he's still he's still acting now. That guy, uh, uh, Fred, and he's in. I mean, he's a very active, still very active career. There's also Art Evans playing a TV uh, installer. Oh, he's great. Uh, he's great. And Michael Brandon playing the the casino lawyer, the other man in the movie. Um, who else? There's definitely some other familiar faces here. I I couldn't necessarily nail down the um, actors' names, but I was like, oh, I've seen so and so. It's a, it's a really neat supporting cast. Maybe the strongest of. I mean, Death of Richie and this I comparable in terms of. Um, yeah, yeah, because these these movies were not drawing on like Incident in Crestridge is different in that it's drawing on a lot of local people that you just never really saw in anything else or very few things. But yeah, the, the, yeah, that's a it's a it is a loaded cast. Oh, um. It's got uh, Michael Talbot is the guy who's running the gambling, um, the the Are game the... at the bar. That's what gets Valerie hooked. Yes, yes. Michael, Michael Talbot, who people of course will recognize from things like First Blood and used cars and used cars. Yes. I mean, yeah, he's he he's a he was a really good character actor in that time. He was also in Freedom briefly too. Oh, very nice. Yeah, no, I yeah. definitely. Oh, Miami, I, of course, from Miami Vice. Miami Vice, yeah, that's the big Vice. one. Is what I remember. But that was af- that was after this. Um, yeah, and then the other, and then this is also shot by Tak Fujimoto. Yes. And, you know, Jonathan Demi's DP, Terrence Malick, um, for he shot Badlands. I mean, he has he shot like so many Demi movies. Uh, he, you know, just an amazing resume. So really cool to see a cinematographer that you know people recognize from you know some of the most acclaimed movies of the new hollywood era and here he is directing or or, or shooting a, a tv movie from that time period and you, and you can and you can um i think you can see you can see it in the the production value and you, you can see it in this in this movie you can see the quality of the 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 photography of it the you know and um also and then the music I was gonna Aside say. from the Eddie Van Halen music, because he Eddie Van Halen and Don Landy did a couple of pieces, but the bulk of the score is by Thomas Newman, and this was very early in Thomas Newman's career. And, you know, now Thomas Newman is like perennial Academy Award nominated winning uh, composer, but this was very early in his career. It was before he even did Desperately Seeking Susan, and around the same time he did a score for Reckless, which I really like a lot oh, as yeah. well. Very synth driven, very because he came from a sort of synth pop new wave music background, popular music background. So very synth driven, uh, very effective score. It really it really does a good job in terms of in terms of heightening her spiral as she just goes. Just just digs it deeper and deeper and deeper hole. Yeah, no, you feel it. You really feel for her. like I. this is one of my my son just happened to be walking by the room on the uh, probably about halfway through. And I just, you know, teed it up for him a little bit and we just started watching and we we're just like, and he, he just got hooked. He was just like, Oh no, what is she doing? Oh my God. It's just one of those movies where you, gambling movies are tough. They're 
incredibly anxiety inducing, but they're still weirdly compelling nonetheless. And so yeah, I and, always... and this, this movie actually does a really good job in terms of making it cinematic. I feel they do a lot. There's a lot of really good use of different elliptical ellipses, you know, with through like fades and dissolves and things to, I think, make it a little more visually interesting. They show her watching there's a scene where she's the like the first scene where she sits at one of the tables in the casino there's like a shot of her watching and you can see being enthralled you know she's being sucked in and then it, there's like a slow dissolve and now she's in sitting at the table in place of somebody who was who she was watching before and and you see her and there's a lot of really good a lot of stuff, obviously, that she does a lot of acting through through her facial expressions. And you see, obviously, so much of that when she's at the table, you know. But sometimes it's hard to tell if she if she did OK. Or yeah. Yeah. It, you're it, just it, looking it, it, at the chip piles and you're kind of like, OK, is that more? You're or trying less to read her because, you know, you're trying to read her face and stuff. But and yeah, stuff the like face that. is really where I could tell. I'm yeah. like, OK, it looks like she won that hand like because she's yeah. smiling or. But yeah, really a great showcase for her, like I, an actor that I definitely recognize and have some respect for but it gave me another level of, yeah like, i think she's under i think i think because so much of what she so much of her acting has been on tv uh, so much of her career is tv so i think she's kind of been under probably been under underestimated or or, or you know just not maybe not as praised as she should be and also i think similarly to incident at Crestridge, that this movie also looks pretty modern in terms of i think i think I think again, it's portrayal of the main protagonist being a woman and the men that she encounters. Like, I think it's pretty, I think it holds up pretty well. I mean, somebody commented already, like every guy in this movie is about as toxic as can be. Like it's not, not wrong. Right? They're not great. There's, they're not, not, crazy. there's not really, there's not really like a savior character if you will there's not like there's not like somebody to really balance balance that out to balance the scales out in terms of like presenting another male character that's like maybe a little more you know positive i guess you could say yeah i I mean which i think is pretty again i think make you know for a tv movie from 1984 i i mean i think that's pretty I, i think that is pretty bold i think that that makes that's something that looks in a through a modern lens looks pretty good. I mean, there's other movies, other things like we had a lot of critiques about dreams. Don't die. For instance, looking at it through a 2023 or whenever we did the commentary, 2021 lens because of that movies, you know, stretches in terms of some of the characters, like in terms of uh, having this, you know, Lily white graffiti writer in New York. And at that time, you know, some of the things felt in that movie, like more of a concession to, TV standards to being like to the early eighties in terms of, you know, representation. But I, I feel like Gina and Crestridge are, uh, you know, maybe a little more ahead of their time in terms of, in terms of representation, in terms of you look at it now. And, and, and I think they look, they look pretty real. They don't, they don't look like so much TV BS, you know, which people love to jump on now, obviously. When you, yeah. when hindsight is 2020, you know what I sure. mean? Sure. No, I'm with you hundred percent. I really do think both are great showcases for their female leads and they both do a great job. Um, closing out the discussion on this, what they, are they, I'm assuming there are 35 elements for both Crest Ridge and seduction of Gina. Those two are, those two uh, is, are from negative, you know, 35 millimeter negative elements, preprint elements. Yeah. They look nice. They, both they, look very they're nice. they're remark- They look markedly better than death of Richie, obviously because they're from much, much better sources. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I thought they both look great to be, to be bold. So, um, so good stuff. And like I said, three commentaries, all seemingly pretty solid. I got to sample each one and I was enjoying each one as I sampled it. So yeah, no, good stuff. Uh, so I'm very excited that you did this set, you know, and following up that, that's that initial set. Um, I should probably let you go, but let's, if you have a second, just maybe a real short pitch on your next two announced releases, What do you got coming? Yeah. So, well, the next one, which is going to street on September 12th, the Primetime Panic, the street date was August 15th. And our next one is 
uh, is a set, another multi-disc set. This is two films. The set is called Fatal Farms, and there are two Paris set early 80s crime films, uh, both directed or co-directed by women. One is uh, Juliette Berteau and Jean-Henri Roger's Neige from 1981, which also co-stars Juliette Berteau. And then the other film is uh, Christine Pascal's La Garce, which translates to The Bitch. And that's from 1984 and stars Isabelle Huppert and uh, Richard Berry. So these are both sort of neon, early 80s, kind of grimy, fun city Paris movies. And uh, we packaged them together just because uh, we haven't released a lot of foreign language films yet at this point. There will be more. Nice. But I just felt that these, since these don't have as much recognition here, similar to the TV movies, I think it's difficult to release these TV movies uh, on their own. I felt that these movies could be creatively packaged in a way. So they're not exactly the same. They're different flavors. I've laid out the ways they're similar, but they're, they are they are definitely different flavors, Neige and Lagarce. And Neige translates uh, as snow. Okay. And, uh, Two films so, I've never heard of, dude. Yeah. So, so they're both they're both um they will both fill that quota for you if you're looking for kind of like a cd uh you know neon lit urban film from that time period uh which we obviously have a lot of already in our catalog which is definitely one of the things that i think we're interested in uh, you know this will this will uh, scratch that itch um Nege is definitely the more well known uh, of the two and acclaimed film so Nege stars Juliette Berteau, who people probably most remember from several films by Godard, such as La Chinoise, Le Gay Savoir, and also for starring in Rivette's uh, Celine and Julie Go Boating. Ah, Alice yes. One. Uh, she's, a, she's an icon of um, French, the French New Wave cinema and... This was her first time as a co co writing and co directing as well as acting. So she's playing a a barmaid in the uh, Pigalle uh, quarter in Paris, which is like a red light district. So and also just filled with like all sorts of kind of outsiders, a lot of immigrants, a lot of LGBTQ uh, folks, and a lot of a lot of uh, addicts. And basically, it involves uh, a character who she who is sort of a surrogate son to her uh a young uh caribbean drug dealer who's killed by undercover police this is not a spoiler it's all in the back of the box and she sort of takes it on herself to try to um to pick up his his action so that all of her so that so that his clients who are desperate for you know their continued uh, fix so that these 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 folks don't die basically so it's basically very forward like it's a very again a very something you would probably not see in an american film and that it the that the film is not judging this the film is not judging the you know uh the the addicts or trying to cure the addiction it's basically like this person needs help and i'm going to try to help this person because they're part of this community and so the movie is very much about this 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 um kind of community of misfits if you will or outsiders you know people that are not really um you know part of the mainstream so this would be like the pigal would be like uh uh you know akin to in some ways to like you know the deuce at that time you know like, like the 42nd street area in new york city it was like gotcha. it was some way similar to that so like a lot of a lot of sex workers and a lot of kind of cd movie theaters and porno theaters and stuff like that so there's a lot of great photography and location footage and just environment milieu you know it's really chock full of all that good stuff and it's really but it's also like i think a powerful um it's a powerful story it's an and it's it, you know it's an it's a captivating story as well excellent the other film lagarce is sort of more of like a throwback uh, to classic um, Hollywood noirs, a little bit of a <clears throat> little bit of a little bit of a Hitchcockian kind of feel, and that Isabelle Huppert is playing 
multiple characters or a character with multiple identities and uh richard berry is playing a a you know police officer who's kind of like a, a detective former police detective who's thrust into this very kind of convoluted web of various criminal figures including isabelle Huppert. and it's set in uh sort of like the garment district of paris at the time which is uh called the sentier so these both movies have like very strong feel for like sp very sort of specific parts of paris which i like you know the first one the neige is it, the neige is set in the pigal and in the quarter and and uh lagarth uh is in the the sentier quarter so these are like places that were kind of known they have they have a they have a very specific character and characters that are within that that live within them so uh, so yeah, so both of those movies, they've never really come out here officially. So I'm very uh, intrigued after those cool to, lowdowns. Yeah, fun to package them together, and I think we have we have some pretty good, uh, we have some pretty good commentaries. Sam Deegan did commentaries, and we have some pretty good uh, booklet essays as well. That just giving you a little more of the history, the significance of Juliet Berto, significance of Christine Pascal, who was a who was an actress as well as a filmmaker. And, and, and again, uh, like uh, someone whose work has not really been investigated closely yet, certainly not in like the, you know, in this era of uh, Blu-rays, DVDs. So hopefully that will, you know, will we'll start to change with with uh, with with this release. Very nice. And then you got one more that you announced that I'm very curious about. Yes. So the 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 last one is uh, the first film uh, in a new um, uh, partnership that we have with with uh, Paramount Pictures. Ooh, very exciting. Very exciting. So it's T. R. Baskin. It's a film directed by Herbert Ross, and produced and written by Peter Hyams, and starring Candace Bergen in the title role of T. R. Baskin. And it's very much a character movie. Another urban set movie also falls into what i was talking about before in terms of like fun city but other cities this one's fun city chicago oh very cool it's very early 70s chicago there's not a lot of movies that were made in chicago at that time um medium cool was a few years before this and this was like years and years before you had all the movies like the uh, blues brothers and all the john hughes movies when when chicago was used all the time but if you look back in the 70s there were not a lot of movies made in chicago because i think mayor daly was not a big uh, fan of hollywood especially after the way the city was portrayed in medium cool it's not the <laughs> most flattering it's not the most flattering portrayal of the police there or it is of, not <laughs> or of mayor daly for that matter true enough so anyway so tr baskin is really interesting just for that like just for the architecture, Chicago's a beautiful, beautiful city architecturally. And this movie has cinematography uh, by uh, Gerald Hirschfeld, whose work I think a lot of our audience will be familiar with because he shot a lot of movies for Frank Perry and he shot movies nice. for Sidney Lumet and um, Larry Pierce. Excellent. And, uh, so, uh, and then it has... Um, so anyway, the story, I'll just give you the story. It's basically a, it's a story about a young woman coming from a small town, trying to make it big, you know, trying to find success and happiness in the big city. And she just finds, she learns how cold and unfeeling and uh, how nasty the city can be. A city can be a big city. And so she moves from Ohio to Chicago in this case. And the co-stars, uh, Peter Boyle, right after he had been in Joe. Mm. And... James Kahn, just about right before he was in The Godfather and Brian's song. So he was kind of up and coming. So it's great uh, to see all these actors in their in their prime. But a lot of people haven't seen this movie because it never officially it was never released on home video on any format up until a few years ago. There is an Australian DVD, but but throughout the whole home video era in the United States, never released on any tape or disc or anything. So that's one reason why I think it became kind of obscure and hard to see. So very excited about it. It's a new 4K restoration from the original camera negative. 
and uh, we have a new video interview with Peter Hyams. Nice. And then we have some uh, article, you know, booklet article and commentary by people who have real Chicago connections. As I was very, it was very important to me to have this movie have some, have people could really speak to the Chicago-ness of this movie. I lived in Chicago for a few years. I spent a lot of time in the upper Midwest, so I appreciate it, but I'm not from there. And I really wanted to make sure there were people that could really speak to that quality. Because like I said, it's a rarity. There's not a lot of Chicago movies or made in Chicago movies at this time. So so there should be plenty of contextual stuff there to go along um, with the movie. I can't wait. And that just announcing that Paramount uh, a partnership is truly exciting. I can only imagine what might be coming uh, from you. There's definitely a lot more stuff that I'm very excited about and we'll be excited to talk to you about and other people I think will be excited about too. So fantastic more to come. Congrats on that. Yeah. TR Baskin is one that I will blame the lack of home video release for myself having not seen it, but so intrigued by all the parts that you've mentioned in in terms of the cast, the writing, the directing Herbert Ross. I'm a big fan of Herbert Ross. So can't wait, really can't wait to see that one. So very, very cool. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what you think of it. When, yeah. After you see it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to like it. Um, anyway, thank you so much for your time, sir. It's always a pleasure to talk to an old friend about uh, what's going on. And uh, I definitely yeah. recommend Primetime Panic 2 to anybody that's watching or listening. Well worth your time. Oh, and you can order it. Sorry, before we go. Yeah. You can order it directly. You can order all three of these directly from us at funcityeditions.com. You can Excellent. find them other places too, but we'll pack them real carefully. Maybe throw in a little extra stuff. Um, Good to know. Good yeah, to know. Fun, funcityeditions.com. Primetime Panic 2 is shipping now. Excellent. And, uh, we are taking pre-orders on the other titles. Great. So everybody head over to funcityeditions.com to pick up your Fun City movies, the ones we've just been talking about, and future releases. Thanks again, sir. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Same. Uh, talk to everyone very soon with more uh, Blu-ray love coming your way. Thanks again.